On today's show, where do we stand with Klay Thompson? Should he start? Should he come off the bench? How does he change the Mavs starting five? We'll talk about that and more on today's Locked On Mavs. I'm Luka Doncic and this is Locked On Mavericks Podcast. If you don't believe, you shouldn't be here. You are Locked On Mavs. Great, Rusty. Your daily Dallas Mavericks podcast. No Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Amazing. Your team every day. Still can't even help me. And welcome. You are locked on to the Dallas Mavericks. My name is Nick Angstead, media member and NBA channel manager for the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for being part of the show, making Locked On Mavs your first listen today. But the best way you can help us grow the show is to listen every day on any podcast platform. Leave a five star review, take us with you, like the video on YouTube, and comment anything below. Let me know in the comment section what's your biggest question about Clay Thompson this season? Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more as playoffs wind down. The sports stops sporting like we want them to. But this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. And joining me, the YouTube collab that people have been asking for from Mavs Digest. Marcel, what you got for me? Hey, Nick. First of all, thank you so much for having me on. Like you said, this is what people have been asking for for a while. (laughs) So we got to give the people what they want. But I just wanted to say before we start anything that Dwight Powell will retire a Maverick and his jersey number will be in the (laughs) rap. Wow. Wow. (laughs) Hey, that's a good place to start. What I I was talking to to, uh, my barber, who's a Mavs fan. Uh, Mm -hmm. Shout out to Eric. He, uh, Eric Gill, he is, uh, he, I'll say they should, they should have a statue of Dwight, but proportionate to the impact. So the Dirk yes. statue is massive and they should have a Dwight statue that's next to it. That's like a bobblehead size or, yes. or, or yes. like, or like, uh, you know, desktop size where it's, it's him getting hit in the face. That's what they should do. It's iconic. How many times this man gets hit in the face. So that has to be a part of the statue bobblehead. Maybe even just a Funko pop size of Dwight Powell <laughs> getting hit in the head. Yeah, oh, up. the head the size of the fungal pop too, with the with the eyes yep. popping out. Because <laughs> <laughs> amazing. Today we're going to talk about Clay Thompson a little bit. I also want to talk about uh, just get Marcel's uh, opinions. You guys haven't heard from him yet, and so we'll talk about the most underrated move, players that need to prove the most to him, uh, players that he's higher on than, than others. Just want to get his opinion on the off season. But let's start here with Clay Thompson because on Monday, slightly and I did an episode where we talked about who's the third best player on the Mavericks. And I got to the I got to the point where I was like, you know what? I think it's going to be Derek Lively because I think his impact defensively, his impact in the pick and roll, his impact in the short roll, his impact, you know, maybe he adds a three point shot, which then spaces the floor a little bit. All that will add up to I think he's got to be one of the most impactful players, one of the best players. But then I started thinking about it afterwards, after we hit play and after after we hit record, I was like, Am I overthinking this on Clay Thompson? So Marcel, tell me, where do you stand on Clay Thompson? The whole, the whole conversation of does he start? Should he be the is he the third best player in the maps? Am I overthinking it? So first of all, I don't want to disrespect Derek Lively in any way. He had an amazing rookie year. He had even better playoff run, which we haven't seen a rookie play that well in a very long time, let alone a Mavericks rookie play that well since Luka Doncic, right? So Derek Lively is due for a huge jump in his own career in the second season. However, I don't think he's going to be the third best player. I think with him being in the starting position, being our starting center, he's still going to split time with Daniel Gafford. So that's still going to be a 1A, 1B situation Mm. with those two. You're still going to see both of them on the court for the same amount of time. At least I believe he will. But I do think that Klay Thompson will be our third best player, just knowing that he can shoot the three ball at a very high efficiency. What nine attempts a game shooting over 40 percent is huge for us. And even though he is older, he's dealt with major injuries in his career over the last few seasons. He still played the majority of the games. I think he played about 77 games a season just last year, which is something that you can rely on. And being on the Dallas Mavericks, you're playing behind Luka Doncic, you're playing behind Kyrie Irving. Those are going to be our one and two. And so Klay Thompson being in a smaller role as our star small forward is going to be huge for us where he's can he can benefit from playing like clay just in a smaller role without having to rely on you know if steph curry is not shooting well now you got to shoot well where now it's like if luke is not good okay we got Kyrie, and if for whatever reason both of them aren't shooting well hey clay please save us which i'm sure he can do and a lot of people like to look at the whole oh he went oh and 10 in an elimination game <laughs> If we judge every player by their worst game, then a lot of these players are very bad players. You also have to take into account that he was probably dealing with a lot of weird um, contract negotiations with the Warriors. Wasn't yeah. sure where he stood. And I don't know about you, Nick, but I I looked at it as I'm Clay Thompson. 
I've helped you win all of our championships since I've been here. I've, I've always been an integral part of this team. Yes, I dealt with injuries, but even coming back, I still did what I need to do to help us win another championship. And I just saw my teammate, Draymond Green, knock out Jordan Poole and get suspended, multiple suspensions that season, but you also gave him a $100 million contract? Right. And you want me to back up Brandon Podzimski? It's very weird. And I think Clay Thompson will show us that he isn't what people may think he is. That he still has a lot to give to a team that's trying to make it back to the finals. He's got a lot to prove. And that's sort of the angle where, okay, how do, how do you think Clay is going to come back and play? Because there's some people that think, I was just on Locked On Fantasy with Josh Lloyd the other day, where he was like, you know, in his Australian accent that I won't try to replicate, that, you know, maybe he's washed like maybe he maybe he's washed where he he got some volume with the warriors and you think all right well if he just if he can't bring some of the things that he, that the Mavericks need him to bring because the issue that Josh brought up was is, is an apt one i thought with clay thompson he's got his the things that he's good at the getting his own shot the running around screens the, the doing the, doing those things are going to be limited a little bit because of the ball dominance of luka and kyrie then you have all right we need in that role, you need the dirty work wings. That's how it's worked before. The Dorian Finney-Smith, Reggie Bullock combo. The Derek Jones Jr., P.J. Washington combo. Now, all of a sudden, if you make one of those two wings a Clay Thompson, who is not as good at some of those dirty work things anymore, then does that lessen his like effectiveness? And then all of a sudden, you go, okay, oh my gosh, we're starting a 35-year-old Clay Thompson in February. Kyrie Irving, who's going to be 33, who is six, uh, you know, small guard. Luka Doncic, who has had his injuries and things, and the defense waxes and wanes during the season like the moon. Yeah. And you go, that's our perimeter team. That's our perimeter defense. Now Derek Lively has to be the third best player because of the way the defense is. And so that's that's where I start to go with it. But then there's your point where it's, well, he's got something to prove, and he comes in and he fills the he fills some of the gaps that the Mavericks had. And so maybe he won't be as effective as he as he has once been, but he'll still be effective for the Mavericks. Yes, and the way that you can kind of look at it if, if you're trying to cope with this trade like I have, because I miss Josh Green, What's, I really do. We're we're months, we're like how, how many months <laughs> removed from this trade are we? I mean, we're this is the full cope where we're like, okay, this trade happened so, in July in July sixth. We're a month removed from this. And we're like, yeah. okay, now we've overthought it in so many different ways. Oh yeah, you know, I kind of just convinced myself, no, this is okay. But if you want to look at it the way I look at it, is if he's going to take the same amount of shots as Tim Hardaway Jr. did. Is he a better defender than Tim Harvey Jr.? Some people might say they're the same. I'd argue that even Oof. if they are the same, I mean, I don't think he is. I, I Tim Hardaway Jr. couldn't couldn't defend me. I'm just saying. But <laughs> in all seriousness, in all seriousness, Clay Thompson, his efficiency scoring will make up for the lack of defense that he may or may not have because right. it's still to be seen until we see him play. But I'd also argue that in terms of just Derek Jones Jr. and how he was our point of attack defender. I'd argue that he wasn't that great of a defender until after the trade deadline when we got P.J. Washington and we got mm. Daniel Gafford. Mm. And me, I love basketball, especially the defensive end. I'm, I was always a defensive-minded player when I was younger. And one thing that I always knew is if I can trust the other four guys on the court with their own defensive assignments, I can focus solely on mine. I don't have to worry about help defense. I don't have to worry about switching too much. So when you get someone like P.J. Washington, you get someone like Daniel Gafford, who both were – P.J. Washington looked like our best on-ball defender after the trade <laughs> deadline. He couldn't really shoot. The, the, you know, the offense wasn't there quite yet, but his defense was amazing. And you got yeah. Daniel Gafford, who he might be a 6'10 center, but he still can hang with the big guys, right? So Derrick Jones Jr. now doesn't have to worry about rotating. He doesn't have to worry about doing too much help defense so he can just focus solely on other guards, which he did mm. do very well. And I guess playing devil's advocate, we don't have that anymore. And with Klay Thompson, it will take, I think, the rest of the team just being good defenders to just help Klay Thompson. Maybe maybe helps not the right word, but knowing that we do have a Najee Marshall where if Klay looks like a, a defensive liability, all right, put Najee problem solved or we got a Quentin Grimes we have other great defenders we got rid of the majority of our defensive liabilities I'd argue I love Josh Green he wasn't the best in defending the that pick and roll he always got lost right. on the screen every right. single time so we got rid of some of our weaker defenders and if Clay Thompson is our weakest defender I'll live with that all day every day the problem is he's going to be in the starting lineup with Kyrie and Luca, who can be solid defenders. We've seen Kyrie; he wants to he wants to be a power forward and says he wants to you know do the dirty stuff and defend and all that. And Luca, who we've seen in the past, can be a good defender, can step up and and stop Kawhi in the playoffs. Like we saw that happen before our eyes. And then you see some other games where you go, "Oh my God, is this the worst defender in the NBA?" Like you did the way yeah. it waxes and wanes you talk about. And then yeah. 
you know, I think I do. I think it's going to work with like I, I'm not. I'm not questioning that it will work because I think the scheme will help. Will help Clay. I think that they all have to be on the same page. I think they all have to to work together, and everybody has to like. There can't be a weak link. Uh, and I think that you're right about the the bigs, like having a, a lively behind him, having a Gafford behind him, having a PJ Washington on on the wing next to him. Well, helps that he can focus instead of having like. I mean, they had no players over six nine on the. <laughs> On the Warriors last no, season, so none. that's a that's a difference. But coming up, let's talk about um, how else Clay changes the starting five. We kind of talked about the Derek John Jr. to Clay Thompson thing, but let's get really into it. Let's talk about how he changes that starting five. We'll get into that with Marcel coming up. I don't believe you shouldn't be here. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. FanDuel Sportsbook has all kinds of props and odds that you can use to get in on the action. Talk about sports, bet on sports, get into it. Oh. WNBA is coming back. Satu Sabli was at practice today for the for the our Dallas Wings. I'm into it. I'm ready to go to some Wings games to end the season. Their first game back, they will be a six and a half point favorite at home against the Connecticut Sun. So that's one you could look at if you're thinking that the Connecticut Sun are frauds. You can do that. Uh, they have a Caitlin Clark tab, which I find hilarious, that just has like their games and all kinds of stuff. They have an Angel Reese tab. They have all kinds of different stuff like that. So get in on the WNBA. Uh, the Dallas Wings chances to win the, the, the championship plus 50,000. So, you know, if you've got a hundred lying around that you just want to catch on fire, but if they win, you win $50,000, man, you might as, well, might as well go for it, right? Go check out FanDuel. They have boosts and bonus every day, all the time throughout the NBA off season, but they've got sports going on all the time. FanDuel.com. Shut it down. Thanks, everybody, for hanging out with us on Lockdown Maps, being part of the show, part of the Raccoon Squad, listening every day. Appreciate you and every one of you for checking out the show. We've got a uh, – make your second listen today, Locked On NBA. Locked On NBA, I'm there on Thursday. So if you're listening to this on a Thursday, I'm there. Me and Pat, the designer, breaking it down, everything you need to know in the NBA in 30 minutes or less. So go check out that show, Locked On NBA. Make it your second listen. All right, I'm here with Marcel from Mavericks Digest. We've been talking about Klay Thompson. One of the questions I wanted to ask you was – how does he change the starting five? How does Clay Thompson change the starting five? Going from Derrick Jones Jr. to Clay Thompson, how does it change? I think, well, assuming that Jason Kidd knows what he's doing, because I think he has the toughest job out of anybody. Having all of these options now, you have no excuse to fail, right? Wait, hold on, hold but, on, with, J- with Jason Kidd. You gotta ask them. I'm just the coach. <laughs> I mean, I'm just the coach. You gotta ask them exactly. But having Clay Thompson in lieu of Derrick Jones Jr. I understand how some people are worried that that's a, you know, that's a big drop in defense, but that's just one player. We have better defenders. So I'm not, I'm honestly not too worried about the defense, but that definitely opens up, opens up our offense because we already know about the gravity that is Luka Doncic, where if you're not putting your best defender on him, that's going to, he's going to torch you for 50 and we've seen it happen, right? Or they'll give you a 40 point triple double that he did for 10 plus games in a row. You got to put your best defender on Luka. And then there's Kyrie. Yeah. But are you really going to play your three best defenders if you want to also cover Clay Thompson? You're going to have to respect the shot. And if you don't, he will make you pay for it. He had a game where he scored, what, 60-plus points while taking less than 10 dribbles? The catch and shoot. That's Clay Thompson. Now, he's not that same Clay. We get that. But you got to respect the shot. And with Clay Thompson in our lineup, that adds to our offense, that adds to our options, which in turn can also create more for Derek Lively. Sure, you put your three best defenders. We're going to abuse the pick and roll, and you will not have an answer for Derek Lively. Point blank period. So offensively, it adds another layer of what we can do, even if you want to pull Clay Thompson in the first two minutes so he can run with the second unit. Sure, you Mm. can do that. It gives you more options so you don't feel like you have to stick to the same rotations every single night. I think we saw in the finals where the Mavs just ran out of guys to to do things with the ball and to to create offense and Derek Jones, I could just see Derek Jones Jr. being open all the time. P.J. Washington being open all the time. And those guys showed up really big in the Thunder series, showed up really yeah. big in, in moments to get them to the finals. But then once it got to the finals, it was, oh, my gosh, this moment is, is so big. And for Clay Thompson, those moments will not be big. Through the regular season, through the playoffs, into the finals, he's been there. Four-time NBA champion. And so, like you said, it, it'll open up the offense. It'll open up uh, to where I think – one of the, the biggest things is PJ Washington is just going to get left open all the time because Wide like you, like you said, PJ is going to get the fourth best defender or, you know, a fourth best perimeter defender f- from every team because you don't, you're not going to put one on, you're not going to put one of your worst ones on clay. You're not gonna put one of your worst ones on Kyrie or Luca. 
And so now PJ is going to be guarded by, you know, whoever, like pick, like pick your poison out there. And uh, I think that it's going to be really good for PJ. He's going to have a, a, a big season, I think, or at least a, a lot that he's going to be able to do this season. The defensive end with Clay Thompson is the one that everybody's kind of worried about. And like you said, he may not be out there with that starting five for very long. And I'm very curious how Jason Kidd man like monitors that because you've got Najee Marshall and I'm talented at everything. So. You know, he's he's good at he's good at everything. And so you you bring him in, and I think that if the defense is is not good and you start to see that there's like big cracks in the in the defense where those three perimeter defenders can't play in this, this scheme together in the regular season with regular season intensity, because that, that could happen. We've seen this right. we've seen this team with Jason Kidd's defensive scheme go down hard because there's a couple of weak links, right? Yeah. Like I, I can still remember 2022, 2023. I try not to. Huh? It's back. It's what? back there. <laughs> what year? I don't, it, I don't know what we're talking about. It's, it's back there. No. But uh, yeah. And so I think that I'm curious how he, he handles it. And that's one of the, what's one of the things that I, I come back to with, with clay is what if the defense is even worse than we are like expecting it to be. And that's where it slips for him more. So we know he's gonna be able to shoot the offense. I've gotten, I've honestly got no issues or, or concerns. It's the, the defensive side. I'm still like hold up in and I, I, we won't be able to know until like, honestly, probably a month, two months into the season when the scheme gets together and all that. Yeah. And I think one thing that can, we can all be rest assured about is that clay Thompson won't have the toughest defensive assignment right? We're not putting Clay Thompson on their best player to defend. He'd probably defend their second or maybe third best player, honestly, depending on the lineup, of course. But if PJ starts on the first one. I'm putting PJ on anybody's best player. I might be a bit too high on PJ. Lock him up, PJ. So you play the, you, you're playing the Bucks. The, the, the Mavs are playing the Bucks. Yeah. Who guards Dame? I put Kyrie who, on Dame. I put who Kyrie guards Giannis? Derek Lively. Come on now. Come on, <laughs> come on, D Live, D Live, yeah! Wow, that's the, that, it's going to be the problem. Okay, you guard the, so you're playing the Lakers. Let's say they put Anthony Davis at the four. Who guards AD? Who guards LeBron? See, that is tough. That's that 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 is very tough because I don't know who guards LeBron. Luca, maybe sure. You throw Luca on because they're <laughs> they're both similar players. Sure, you put Luca on LeBron. Just wish it, you know, you pray it works. Uh, AD. I could still put Derek Lively on him. The thing about Derek Lively that is so different from other bigs, and he's going to do his second year, so we don't know what is to be expected, but we can all agree that what we saw is a lot better than what we thought we were getting from Derek Lively. And the one thing that yeah. I love about him is the, his ability to just grow. We saw, at least I saw in the beginning of the season, where if they ever did a switch and they pulled Derek Lively to the perimeter, smaller mm -hmm. guards would blow by him. But I saw that just never being a problem in the playoffs. They would pull Derek right. Lively, He's staying in front of you the entire time. If he can continue to work on his footwork and just his positioning as a big man, yeah, I'll put him on Anthony Davis, and I'm not worried about if Anthony Davis wants to space the floor. I don't care if you want to just go whoever it is. I have a lot of faith in Derek Lively just from what I've seen his rookie year because even now I bet you he'll play better than what I think he is because that's the type of player that he is. Yeah, it's a tough one. You play the Suns, then all of a sudden you, you think that Clay isn't going to guard – he's not going to guard Booker. Maybe he'll guard Beal and then Kevin Durant. You're like, okay, uh, now, now – well, I mean, I mean, if it's the Suns, I'll put Clay Thompson on Bradley Beal. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not worried about Bradley Beal at this point in his career. I'm really not. <laughs> and that's no disrespect to Bradley Beal or any Washington Wizards fans. I'm not. It kind of is a disrespect to Bradley Beal. I mean, I mean, this is not the same Bradley Beal from Washington. That's all I'm saying. That that, that is all I'm right. Saying. But, well, and he's I mean, not the first option anymore. Exactly. But Clay Thompson, I guess I'll change my my answer. He will be asked to defend better players he won't be defending their fourth or fifth best player he may have to defend right. and and then that's when we may have to work on our own schemes maybe we do need to add more help defense more rotations more switching which or maybe clay thompson turns it up i mean if worst case scenario if clay thompson is our worst defender we're still a good team if he's our weakest link i'd much rather be clay thompson than tim hardway jr i'll just say that He's definitely an upgrade over him, but the problem is yeah. that now you're you're going from a team where the defense worked so well, and that's what helped you the last two months of the season to be the best defense in the league and to to make that run to 50 wins, make that run into the playoffs, and get to the finals. You're changing. You're changing. If Clay Thompson is going to, like Sham said at summer league, remember that report where he was like, he's definitely going to start. He's definitely yeah. going to play 30 minutes. All right, you're going to have You're going to have a lot of moments where it's Luca, Kyrie, and Clay. Okay, then. You play the Clippers. Who guards James Harden? Who guards Kawhi Leonard? <laughs> like, all right, you've got, you've got yeah. to answer that. Yeah, we do. And I mean, PJ Washington. I'm I've always been high on PJ. I still think he's, he can defend some of the better players in the league. But I mean, 
in terms can't guard of all Thompson. He, yeah, he can. <laughs> and yeah, and and yeah, we we definitely saw that as well in the playoffs. But I mean, in terms of Clay Thompson and just his defense, I don't want to sit here and act like I'm not worried about it at all or something that we shouldn't worry about. I think it's more of just let's wait and see because in our own our own defensive system may be different than the Warriors to where he actually defends better in our system. We like yeah, we don't right. know yet. But if we're gonna just go off of the worst case scenario, I still think that we're good. I still think that I still have faith in Jason Kidd to figure it out because I think he has the hardest job right now with this team. The thing is though, I'm not playing. I'm watching just like you guys. Yeah, yeah. Th- th- there, there's that. You know, no one died out there, right? You know. No, no one's dying. Have no you seen the, the the fan survey? We talked about it last week with Tim Cato, the the fan survey from the Athletic, where it's like it's it's you know two thousand or so Mavs fans answered a bunch of questions, and he does this every year where he has people answer questions, and one of them was how confident are you in Jason Kidd, and it went from like it went from like everybody was at a three after after. 2022 23 and now like the majority were at a five and i was like man yeah. the confidence of jason kidd has rose and the, the the feeling and the temperature around kid has completely changed in one calendar year it's wild yeah i've i've had my own knee-jerk reactions to jason kidd because he he likes to same experiment with lineups sometimes and it leaves you wondering like, what are you doing <laughs> but when you look at the rosters he's been given i think yeah he has done a good job you know it we missed the playoffs, but that was honestly to get Derek Lively. And it all it all played out, right? But works. that's why I said, you know, going forward, you know, he has the toughest job because this is the best roster that has ever been put around Luka. The mm. b- best roster we've had since we won a championship. You can argue that as well. Mm. You are going to be in the hot seat if anything goes bad. Obviously, look at the players, see how they're playing. But if, let's say, Clay Thompson just goes the first month playing horrible, are you going to put Najee Marshall in that role for Clay Thompson? How do you manage that? You know, you like you were, you were able to manage Luke and Kyrie very well. Now you got Clay Thompson, who was promised something coming here, and if yep. he can't play to that level as a coach, how do you respond? That's going to be the big question, and that's why this is, there's a lot on Jason Kidd. We'll talk about him throughout the rest of the summer too. Coming up, I want to know what's the underrated move this season. What's the Mavs' most underrated move, and who has to who has the most to prove to us? Coming up, we'll talk about that. We don't believe you shouldn't be here. Shut it down. All right, I'm here with Marcel from Mavs Digest. We're talking about the Mavs. This is, I don't know, this is what we do every day, right? Like, <laughs> oh, yeah, every day, even when there's nothing to talk about, talking about the Mavs. That's right. We've been talking about Clay Thompson, but I want to move over to some other guys. What's the most underrated move the Mavs made this offseason? So the most underrated move that I feel like will surprise fans, and I feel like it just isn't being talked about enough, is the acquisition of Quentin Grimes. Mm. Um now, obviously, we traded Tim Harvey Jr. for Quentin Grimes, but when you look at all the moves we made, he's really a replacement for Josh Green, yep. who I think, in my opinion, from all that I've seen, Quentin Grimes will shoot the ball better and defend better than Josh Green. Josh Green did provide a lot of hustle. He was definitely just that spark plug sometimes. You throw him in, he does a quick, you know, he'll have a good defensive stop. He'll get a quick three off. That's great. But I think Quentin Grimes is arguably our most flexible player that you can put him in the lineup if you want to, starting lineup. You could have him be the sixth man off the bench. You could have him run with the second unit. You, like I think he's our most plug-and-play player that will surprise a lot of Mavericks fans with the small things that he can do. His defense is, in my opinion, underrated as a wing player. I think his three has improved. And you look at his first two seasons in New York, he was starting to grow. He was showing signs of growth going very well. And then that third year, you got Jalen Brunson now. You go get a few other players. Your role is kind of un- unsure. And then you hear rumblings that you're getting traded. You go to the Detroit Pistons, where he only played like five or six games. So if you look at his last season stats, I think there's a lot of nuance as to why he didn't look good. But if we look at those first two years in New York, you can see where he was going. And I think that he has all the opportunity to continue that with the Dallas Mavericks. So I think when Quentin Grimes is my pick for the most underrated move. It's like, you, it's like I'm talking to myself. <laughs> <laughs> I've, been, I've literally been saying that, that Quentin Grimes is the replacement for Josh Green. And I've been saying that I, I'm very high on Quentin Grimes coming in because yeah. we've seen him. We've seen him be a starter on the Knicks and guard the best player on the other team. Like if you want the answer for, well, what if Clay Thompson is bad? It could be Najee Marshall, but it could be like Quentin Grimes could come in and be a better point of attack guy. He could replace Derek Jones Jr. in that role. And also remember that Derek Jones Jr., for as much as we've talked about him, as much as the Mavs are going to miss him, as much as he was a big crucial part of it, he played 20 minutes a game. <laughs> he played 20 minutes. A yep. Game. <laughs> and like, yep. he didn't qualify for all defense. Like, you could not vote for a voter, like Brad Townsend, for example, could not vote for Derek Jones Jr. 
because he did not play enough games during the regular season where he played at least 20 minutes. Now, is that on Jason Kidd? Is that, you know, did he take too long to try and play him? Do I have to go to the, oh, do I have that drop still? Where the, <laughs> the Jason Kidd, like, I have to apologize that you felt like he should have played more. <laughs> um, but maybe, but I think with Quentin Grimes, I think you're right. I think he's going to come in and, and his shooting ability, I think it will take a, a little bit with him. I think he'll be one that maybe the first couple of weeks or month, a month of the season will go, man, Quentin Grimes isn't playing as, as much as I hoped that he would play. And then all of a sudden he'll, he'll get into it because he's coming off of, you know, he had an, a knee injury, which is why he didn't really play for Detroit that much. He just yeah. played six games for them. Then he didn't play the rest of the season. And man, that, go, go look at the Pistons schedule from last year. Like, just, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the Pistons, they <laughs> are who they are, right? The they W and the L column is just <laughs> insane from last year, if you look at I, it. But yeah. I'm not holding anything from there against him at all. but uh, And he got replaced by Dante DiVincenzo on, on the Knicks because they needed some more offense. So the Mavs don't need more offense. They need more defense. And so exactly. bringing in Quinn Grimes, hopefully he fills that role. And I think it is, it is a very sneaky, underrated move that I don't think the majority of people are talking about. When it first happened, there's a bunch of media people, like media friends of mine, they were like, oh, Quinn, Quinn Grimes, like, like sneaky. Like, oh, that's a, that's a sneaky good move. I like that yeah. move. And, and I think that it will come back up again when people realize, oh, my God, Quinn Grimes. Remember when, remember when the Mavs got Quinn Grimes for Tim Hardaway Jr. and second? A steal. A steal, yeah. yeah. You know, Quinn Grimes, I think, will surprise a lot of people. But then also just to your point where it may take him a while to really kind of get in his groove. But for what he can and will do for us i bet he'll be the most consistent you know what you're going to get from quentin grimes and i don't think he may have a few bad games every player has a few bad games but i think he'll be one of our most reliable consistent players like okay you put up about eight ten points you had a few rebounds you played good defense a quality game from quentin grimes i can rely on you i'm not worried about you but like what you said he he played as a starter in new york there was a game against the mavericks where he scored what like 40 plus points he had a really good game luca obviously scored more that game but he has the potential and he's still young so he fits the timeline. And I think, again, I think he's a very underrated uh, move that not enough people are really talking about. Who's the player on the Mavs that needs to prove the most to you specifically, you personally, this season? <sighs> okay, so the, I, there's two players. And I'm going to say, I'm going to keep it short and sweet. But the first player is Jaden Hardy, although it's not his fault. If he's not given the minutes he's, and if he's not given the opportunity, that's not his fault, right? But with whatever new role he's given, whatever minutes he is given, as long as he can show that he belongs here, he's good. Otherwise, I can see his moving on from Jane Hardy. But again, it's not because he's not good. It's just if Jason Kidd isn't finding a spot or a place for Jane Hardy, will we ever really get to see what he's made of? Probably not. But the player who I think actually does have the most proof is Maxi Kleba. And I know a lot of people are going to hate mm. me for that. I get a lot of hate whenever I talk about Maxi. But the truth of the matter is, we did not get another stretch forward in this summer. That didn't happen. So the backup to P.J. Washington is still Maxi Kleba. I understand he had an injury. I understand even the finals. I felt like he came back too soon. He kept holding his shoulder every time he shot the ball. Though he was afraid to shoot the ball. His defense, contrary to what a lot of people think, he can still play defense. He's, he can still play quality defense. But if Maxi doesn't at least show that he can be a quality backup power forward, I can see his moving on from him. And what I need from a backup is just, Doing all the small things. I don't need Maxi to hit five threes every night. I don't need Maxi to just lock down LeBron every time we see him. But if any time Maxi's on the floor in lieu of PJ, if everything feels good and, and you're obviously not a liability, cool. That's all I need. Just don't be a liability. But I think Maxi has the most to prove. With Quentin Grimes coming in, with Clay Thompson, with Najee Marshall, who I, I believe that Najee Marshall can play the four. He's pre, he's pretty big and he's he's thick and like I think he could play the four. And so I think that could eventually be your your backup four. Or you play PJ and, and Najee at the same time and you go who's the four, who's the three? It's, I don't know. It doesn't does it really matter? Pick one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so I, I think he does have. I think you're right. I think he has a lot to prove to the to the Mavericks to to everybody. He was effective at times last year, but they also, you know, they they won rounds without him. You know, he wasn't yeah. as crucial yeah. as he's been in the past where remember in 2022 where Dwight Powell would play like 10 minutes and then Maxi would play 30 or something minutes and you'd go, okay, we're just, we're rolling you with this. You keep reminding me of this season and I thought I scrubbed it from my memory. Nick. No, 2022 you. was the good one. That was when you were at the Western Conference Finals. That was, that was a good one. But, but, was... but, but you said Dwight Powell, you know, and it just, it just, you, just you hit. wanted to retire his number and put a statue out front. Man, I got his jersey hanging up behind my computer. I won't show you, but it's up there. <laughs> We took this full circle. And with Jaden Hardy, I man, I was I was thinking the Mavs were out on the Jaden Hardy experience. The, J, the Jason Kidd was out on the Jaden Hardy experience. And then the playoffs happened. 
And he didn't really play a lot against the Clippers. Didn't play a ton against OKC until games, what, five and six. And then all of a sudden he found this role. And then in Minnesota, all of a sudden you're like, wow, like, okay. All of a sudden now you're starting to see it. And now maybe another year with Kyrie, who's been, you know, mentoring him and has been pouring into him. Maybe that helps him a lot. Maybe the competition with Dinwiddie and Exum and all that. He's yeah. got to prove something to the Mavericks. That's an Jaden Hardy is an interesting one for sure because I don't know what his role is. Like, all right, you, you start this, you start the season. This is this is your depth chart, mm-hmm. and uh, this Jaden Hardy. I mean, Jaden Hardy doesn't get rotation minutes with this no. depth chart. No, and I mean, I mean, that's a great problem to have because if we're if we're down bad in the game and we need someone to go to, we can. I mean, I I trust Jaden Hardy. He's instant offense. Obviously, defense is still something that needs to be worked on. But you're right, though. Like, what is your role? Like, you're not our third ball handler. Are you? You're, you're our third shooting guard. Which Jaden Hardy is good for ten quick buckets. Or, you know, 20, ten quick points. He can score. He like he can attack the basket. We saw that in Minnesota. He was going up against Anthony Edwards with no fear, and I loved it. But it's 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 very weird because if he doesn't find a niche to fill, or if Jason Kidd can't find a place for him, I can see the Mavericks moving on from Jane Hardy. And I'm not saying that because I want it to happen because I love the kid. I think he, any team would be happy to have Jane Hardy. But with what this Dallas Mavericks team is trying to do and just the identity of the team, it's 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 starting to look harder and harder to find a spot for Jane Hardy to fit, especially after we got Najee Marshall, Quentin Grimes, Spencer Dinwiddie, even a couple of two-way guys who, who knows, they may look better than Jane. I don't know. A lot of things can happen. A lot of things can happen. Marcel from Mavs Digest, go check out his channel. And uh, and yeah, we'll be back tomorrow. I think we have Dana Larson on the doc- docket tomorrow answering your questions. Guys, thanks so much for listening to Locked on Mavs. Peace out. Boom.